had victory on the cross, that we need no longer be fearful of anything because you have come to save us and to set us free. We thank you, Lord, that we have a home in heaven. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that you have a plan and a purpose for our lives. And so, Father, as we just come before you this morning and we worship you,
Good morning and welcome to the Salvation Army Tustin Ranch. We are so glad that you're joining us in worship this morning. Here at the Salvation Army Tustin Ranch, we love God and we love others. And it is our prayer that you experience God's love here with us. We're praying that you will have a new revelation of who he is. We're praying that uh, God will meet you where you are. And that, that as we worship together and lift his name high, that the things that you are carrying will seem lighter. We're praying that you experience God in a new and a fresh way. And we're praying that you will be encouraged and inspired by what you hear today. And we just want to worship God this morning. So won't you pray with us? God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your great love. We thank you, Lord, that your mercies are new every morning. We thank you, Lord, that you are a God who is rich in mercy, that you are abounding in love, that your grace and your forgiveness is given to us as we need it. Heavenly Father, we thank you, and we just want to worship you. We pray that in everything that we say and do, that we will lift high the name of Jesus, that as we lift high Jesus' name, that people will be drawn to you. And so, Father, we give you our worship this morning. Amen. Good morning, friends. We're so glad that you have joined us in worship this morning. And if this is your first time joining us online, we invite you to go to satrconnect.org and just uh, include some basic information, and uh, we will connect with you. If you have any questions or prayer requests, we would love to be in touch. And so that's the first place you need to go to do that. Also, if you've been checking out our church for the past few weeks or months, we're going to have a free welcome lunch next Sunday after our courtyard service. And so if you want to meet some of our court leadership, if you just want to meet and greet some other folks here at the church family, uh, this is for you. So leave a comment or drop us a message below and to RSVP your spot. And this will be, once again, next Sunday after our outdoor courtyard service. Another community thing that we're doing is on Wednesday mornings. This is called our mini music program. And this is for uh, these young parents with kids ages one through four. It's a great time for sensory activities and playtime, uh, music instruction. And this is held uh, on our campus Wednesdays mornings at 930. And again, send us a comment below uh, if you'd like to RSVP for that because spaces are limited. Quick save the date, June 12th. This is for the teens and the youth in our ministry. We're going to have a dodgeball night. Come on, it's going to be fun. Uh, We have to throw balls at each other. Come on, that sounds like fun, right? So save the date. More information will be available as we get closer to the 12th. And finally, uh, we believe in serving our neighborhood. And in preparation for the 2021 and 22 school year, uh, we want to provide over 300 students uh, with backpacks and school supplies. And so you can begin to to give donations by bringing school supplies uh, to the outdoor worship service at the check-in table. We'll We'll set up a box to receive those Uh, donations, or you can drop off uh, your supplies uh, at the office uh, during the week. We are also accepting cash donations. We'll go ahead and buy the supplies. And so if you just want to drop off some cash or gift cards for us to buy supplies, that will work as well. All right, friends, there's a lot of announcements. Quick way to uh, stay tuned or up to date about what we're doing is follow us on our social media channels and on Facebook or on Instagram or sign up on our weekly email newsletter. All right, friends. Well, let's continue our worship this morning. You are a son and daughter of the Most High God. Amen and amen.
Father's house. Give life.
with your voices, sing it to your breath. come to you this morning singing of your greatness and so fill up our lungs fill up our hearts and our minds with your breath with your presence with your spirit so that not only with our lips but with our lives we would declare of your greatness we want to see all the earth we want to see all the earth declare your praises to give you glory honor and praise to shout out Lord of your greatness we want to see that with our own eyes we want to be a part of that mission that all mankind that every tongue that every nation that every tribe would fall to their knees and declare you are god yes great are you lord great are you lord jesus Great are you, Lord. That is our declaration this morning. Receive it, O Lord. In your name we sing and pray. Amen.
Well, good morning, family and friends watching us online and those who are tuning in for the very first time. We want to say to you that God has a word for you this morning that He's going to revolutionize the way you think and live. Our God is a living God. Our God is interested in intimacy with His people. Our God wants to set you free from wherever you've been and whatever you've been involved in. Our God is a liberator. He's a freedom fighter. Our God is your advocate. He's the one that comes to set the captives free. He's your healer. He's your restorer. He's your redeemer. And this morning, I believe God has got a word for us in this season of life and time. I believe that God has a message, and this morning I believe God has stirred a message upon my heart that I am really excited to share with you this morning. The message that comes is captured in John's Gospel, the 21st chapter, and that's where I'm going to focus in this morning upon. Those those few verses from chapter 21, verses 15 to 17. I believe that God's message for the church today is a message of reconciliation. God calls us to a ministry of reconciliation as the Apostle Paul talks to the church in Corinthians that we are commissioned to be ministers of reconciliation. And we see Jesus demonstrate reconciliation with the Apostle Peter in these passages of Scripture in John 21. But before we get into it, I want to pray. Will you join me in prayer this morning? Wherever you are, whatever position you're in, whether you're sitting, standing, lying down in your bed, I believe that God has a word for us, a word in this season that's going to challenge us, awaken us, shape us, project us into the future. So will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, my prayer this morning is very simple. I pray that you will use the words that come out of my mouth this morning. May you use the words that are stirred in my heart this morning, God. The words that you have gifted me, may it come out clearly and concisely. Lord, speak this morning, because your people are desperate to hear your voice. Your people are desperate to hear your voice in the wilderness that we've been in. So speak, Lord. Lord, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, may it be pleasing, O God, and acceptable today in your sight. Now, this ministry of reconciliation is an important subject matter. In a world today that is more divided than it's ever been, we have been polarized politically, socially, economically, There's been civil unrest in the last 18 months that we haven't seen in a long time. There's been political divisions as we've just had a political election. There's been concern. There's been outrage. The church has been divided. We've taken sides and positions. We've been more polarized than we've ever been before. And many social, political, and economic commentators have said America has been more polarized in this season than it's ever been before. But yet God calls us to a ministry of reconciliation, to reconcile with one another, to be united together. God's message from the very first when Jesus came and He stood amongst men and women. As he read from the scrolls of the prophet Isaiah, he says, I've come to proclaim the year of God's favor. I've come to bring a message of healing and restoration. I've come to bind the wounds of the broken, and I've come to release the prisoners. I've come to set captive people free. I've come to reconcile man with God. I believe the ministry of reconciliation is a powerful one that God is calling His church to again. Between the resurrection that we saw only just recently as we've celebrated Easter, and next Sunday as we await and and speak and celebrate Pentecost, in those 40 days that passed from resurrection 
to Pentecost. God demonstrated something to his disciples as he demonstrates you and I today that I believe is profound and the church needs to hear. God demonstrates that he is an overcomer and that his power is greater than anything else we've ever imagined. The power to resurrect life that is dead, the power to cancel sin, is one of the most powerful stories of the history of mankind. And it's relevant today as it was 2,000 years ago. The power to reconcile is relevant today in a world that is so divided and so concerned about present and future opportunities. I believe that Jesus, in these passages of Scripture, demonstrates the power of reconciliation. And he demonstrated with the apostle that he loves, the apostle that he speaks about, that this man, this man, Peter, Petros, is the man that I will build my church upon, and the gates of hell will not prevail. I believe that when God speaks to Peter, I believe something revolutionary takes place. Here we read in John's Gospel, the 21st chapter, verses 15 to 17. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord. You know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt. Because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Now there's something in the context of this passage of Scripture that I believe it's relevant for us to understand this morning. Firstly, just before this passage happens that I've just read to you from, Jesus gathers Jesus meets his disciples at the Sea of Galilee. Peter is a broken man. He's living in the shadow of his past mistakes. He was the man that denied Jesus before the crow had crowed three times. He was the man that actually disowned who Jesus was. He said, I'm not one of his disciples, even though he was challenged as he gathered by the fire. Peter feels the weight of disappointment. The shadow of pain and suffering of failure. Peter was the one that stood before Jesus in the Last Supper when Jesus was washing the disciples' feet and said, Lord, when? You will not wash my feet, Lord, let me, because I will not allow you to take the role of a servant. Jesus rebukes Peter, challenges him. And Peter says, then, Lord, wash, wash all there is of me. Jesus says, Peter, I do not need to wash all there is of you. I just need to wash your feet. And when Jesus said to the disciples that you will disown me, that you will flee and you'll wander away, Jesus, Peter says to Jesus, I'll never leave you, nor will I forsake you. I will always be with you. And Jesus reminds Peter that when the crow will crow three times, Peter, you yourself will deny me. Even knowing what was potentially to take place, Peter denies Jesus, and he's living with the burdens of regret. 
He's living with the burden of suffering and pain. He's living with all of these doubts in his mind. So he returns back to that place where he was familiar. Fishing for fish. And while they've been fishing all day and all night, we read again that they were unable to catch any fish on that occasion. And Jesus comes to the sea shore of Galilee, and he sees his disciples out on the boat, and he says to them, cast your net on the other side. There's something interesting that's starting to take place in this passage of Scripture. The disciples and Peter himself don't even challenge Jesus. They recognize a familiar voice. They recognize a voice they've heard. And this occasion, Peter doesn't challenge Jesus. He just does what the master asks him to do without a word. They catch a bounty. They rush back to the shoreline. They sit down and they eat together. They have a meal together. And when they finish eating together, Jesus takes the opportunity. Now hear me clearly that the ministry of reconciliation requires initiation. Someone to initiate. Someone to step in. And you know, sometimes you think, well, I am the one that has been offended. I am the one that's been disregarded. Jesus was the one that was denied. But he's the one that initiates. He calls Peter aside. And privately, this conversation and this interaction, I believe, is one of the most profound interactions we can see. Jesus pulls Peter aside and asks Peter a very simple question. Peter, do you love me? But he uses a word for love. That challenges Peter. He uses the word agape. Peter, do you love me sacrificially? Do you love me like only God can love? Peter struggles with his response, but he replies. Read it with me again. Peter says, in the scripture that we read, Peter says, to Jesus when asked this question. Peter, Simon Peter, do you love me more than these? Peter replies emphatically, yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Peter changes his response. When Jesus says, Peter, do you agape me? Peter says, yes, Lord. You know that I filias you. I love you as a brother. And Jesus says to him, then feed my lambs. This interaction happens three times. And Jesus asks Peter on occasion one and two, Peter, do you love me? Do you agape me? Do you agape me? And the first time he says, feed my lambs. And then the second time he says, take care of my sheep. And then on the third occasion, Jesus says to Simon Peter, do you love me? And he uses the word phileus. Do you love me as a brother? And at this, the word of God says that Peter is crushed. Everything comes out and says, Lord, you know all things. He says, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. 
You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. I want to tell you, friends, that the story that Peter and Jesus has is a real story. It's a story about you. It's a story about me. It's a story about us. It's a story of our failings and our fumblings and our mistakes and our embarrassment. It's a story of our shame and our guilt and our disappointment. It's a story of mankind falling short of the glory of God. It's a story of all of the above. But yes, Jesus demonstrates to Peter, as he does to us, the ministry of reconciliation. I want to tell you, friends, that God is calling his church to be reconcilers in the world, not proponents of division and hatred and taking positions that separates us and pulls us apart. The enemy wants to separate the church. The enemy wants to get us to galvanize ourselves in different positions. But God is a God of reconciliation. When he extended his arms of the cross of Calvary, he was the God that united mankind, and he brought us together, and he unifies the church. But it takes someone to be the initiator. Jesus was the initiator. And he was modeling to you and I that we need to be the initiators of reconciliation. How do I be a minister of reconciliation? I need to be an initiator of reconciliation. I need to go to my brother who may have offended me, who may have hurt me, have disappointed me, accused me belittled me, spoke poorly about me, hurt my feelings, maybe even stolen from me, and be the initiator of God's grace. The ministry of reconciliation requires an initiator, and we, the church, you, my brothers and sisters, are called to be the initiators of reconciliation because the Apostle Paul says we have been given a calling a calling to be ministers of reconciliation. We have been called to be ministers of reconciliation. Read this with me. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11. Since then you know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade others. What we are is plain to God, and I hope it is also plain to your conscience. We're not trying to commend ourselves to you again, but are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than what is in the heart. If we are out of our mind, as some say, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Are you hearing this, my friends? We need to change our world perspective. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he, she, is a new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. All this from God, we reconciled ourselves to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. God was reconciling the world, and He gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Friends, I want to say to you this morning, God wants you to start to reconcile. Reconcile with those around us. Wherever they may position themselves, we are to reconcile. The second thing we understand, it's more than just reconciliation that we see there. Initiating reconciliation. 
Jesus did something quite unique. He initiated and then he restored. He restored Peter to the position and the authority of who God had called him and created him to be. You have been called and created to be someone. You, my friends, are called to be ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And whatever has hindered you, whatever hurt, pain, suffering, has been the story of your past, let it not be the story of your future. Because Jesus wants to restore you to where he's called you to be. Jesus restores Peter, Peter, Petros, the rock on which I will build my church, the rock, the foundation stone in which we will minister the gospel to a broken world. Peter, you need to be that man again. Do you love me, Peter? Do you love me? Feed my lamb. Do you love me? Take care of my sheep. Do you love me? Feed my sheep, Peter. Jesus works through the process of restoring this man. God is in the business of restoring us to be who he called us to be. Ministers of reconciliation. As he restores Peter, he renews Peter's vigor. Peter is not the same broken man any longer. Even by Jesus calling him from the shore of Galilee, Peter, immediately, the broken, dejected, slow-moving, hurt Peter, stands up and we read in Scripture, he moves with haste. He pulls in the nets. He pulls in the fish and he moves to the shore of Galilee. And they eat together. They fellowship together. When restoration takes place, fellowship takes place. They fellowship together. They reconnected together. They ate together. They built relationship. Because from restoration, from reconciliation to restoration, relationship renews. God has created you and I to be in relationship with one another. Not to be divided and estranged from each other. We are built to have intimacy, relationship with one another. When ministry of reconciliation takes place, there is relationship. God wants us to bridge the gap and relate to one another in fellowship. To eat with one another. To dine with one another. To connect with one another. Just recently, April 25th, sorry, April 28th, our family celebrated 25 years of the passing of my father. 25 years since his death or murder in a beautiful place called Port Arthur on the Tasmanian coast in Australia. And as I stopped and reflected on what took place 25 years ago, I remember at the first anniversary of the death of my father, my mother, my brother, and I traveled to Tasmania. And there in Tasmania, we were there for a memorial service. One year after his death, we were there in the same location of the Broad Arrow Cafe. With so much happening in our minds and hearts, there was little time to sleep. We struggle to sleep. And early the next morning, very early the next morning, my mother 
shared with us what transpired for her that night. She said to us, in the middle of the night, as she wrestled to sleep, she felt an angel of the Lord appear to her. And in the middle of the night, she said, while she wrestled to sleep, the angel of the Lord that appeared to her showed her an image of that man, Martin Bryant, that killed my father that day and terrorized my mother and many others in the Broad Arrow Cafe where 35 people were murdered. And so the image the angel of the Lord showed her was the image of Martin Bryant, but Martin Bryant as one of her two sons. And she said when she saw that image, the Lord said to her, if Martin Bryant was one of your sons, would you forgive him? And in the pain and the anguish of the moment, as a heart was broken and a spirit was being stirred, she said, if it was one of my sons, of course, as a mother can only forgive her child, she would have forgiven and she will forgive. You see, my friends, as we embrace this ministry of reconciliation, God says that he has created us all in his image. We are all sons and daughters of the king. We are all children of the most high God. No, what, no matter what your brother or sister may or may have not done, we are called to be ministers of reconciliation. To bring healing and restoration in those darkest hours and those most desperate moments. Jesus speaks to Peter and says, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? And Peter, in his anguish, realizes what God is actually doing. He knows his Father in heaven is reconciling him. He knows he's healing his deepest of wounds. He knows he's cleansing him. He knows he's restoring him back to who he called him to be. Because that's what your Father in heaven does. He reconciles with you. He restores you so that you can be His hand and feet to a broken world. So you can be ministers of reconciliation to a polarized nation, to a divided people, and say, come together. Let's gather together at the banquet table of the King of Kings, and let's be one in Christ Jesus, because we are united not by political parties or entities or teams. We are united by the fact that we are kingdom children. You belong to the kingdom of God. Your definition and your definition of who you are is not in the things of this world, but in the things of heaven. Or it's not defined in your denomination. It's not divine, defined where you live in your geographic location. It's defined in your kingdom identity. You're a child of the Most High God. So friends, I want to invite you this morning in the last few moments we have together because I believe God is speaking prophetically to His church because Pentecost was when the church had a baptism of fire. I'm praying that the same fire of the Holy Spirit will purge down upon us as people of God and remove the sin that has prevailed over our thinking and our hearts and our attitudes and our dispositions because we are children of the Most High God. Amen? Holy Spirit, come again. Holy Spirit, unite us. Let us be your ministers of reconciliation. Let us be your ministers of healing. Let us be willing to forgive. 
Let us be willing to repent and kneel at the altar and say, God, I do love you. God, I am willing to reconcile, to restore, to renew who it is you've called me to be. Lord, do that now. Do that in our church. Do that in our family. Do that in our cities. Do that in our nation. Do that in the world that we live in. Let's put aside the pettiness of the world. And let us fix our eyes upon Jesus, the author and perfecter of all things. Let us not become so politically and socially minded that we forget that we are kingdom people and that we are called to be kingdom minded. Let us be like Peter at the Sea of Galilee, allowing you to embrace us to teach us, to remind us, to restore us of who you've called us to be. Let that be our call today, to be willing to forgive, to be willing to restore broken relationships, to be willing to embrace a spirit of healing, because your word says to us, we are new creations in Christ. The old is gone, the new has come. That's our prayer this morning. Will you pray with me? Father, where there is unforgiveness, where there's hatred, where there's anger, where there's disappointment, and where there is shame, Holy Spirit, deal with that heart of mine. Deal with that hardness of spirit and heart that I have. Oh, Lord, break me. Oh, Lord, melt me. Oh, Lord, mold me and make me more like Christ today. In Jesus' name, I pray and ask for me, for my friends, for my family, for my church, for my nation. In Jesus' name, amen.
Our benediction this morning comes from Ephesians chapter 3. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know that this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than, than all we ask or imagine, according to the power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Thank you.